Chapter One of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Chapter One Pariah. The air of the city's cheapest flop house was thick with the smells of harsh antiseptic and unwashed bodies. The early Christmas snowstorm had driven in every bum who could steal or beg the price of admission, and the long rows of cots were filled with fully clothed figures. Those who could afford the extra dime were huddled under thin, grimy blankets. The pariah, who had been Dr. Daniel Feldman, enjoyed no such luxury. He tossed fitfully on a bare cot, bringing his face into the dim light. It had been a handsome face, but now the black stubble of beard lay over gaunt features and sunken cheeks. He looked ten years older than his scant thirty-two, and there were the beginnings of a snarl at the corners of his mouth. Clothes that had once been expensive were wrinkled and covered with grime that no amount of cleaning could remove. His tall, thin body was awkwardly curled up in a vain effort to conserve heat, and one of his hands instinctively clutched at his tiny bag of possessions. He stirred again, and suddenly jerked upright with a protest already forming on his lips. The ugly surroundings registered on his eyes, and he stared suspiciously at the other cots. But there was no sign that anyone had been trying to rob him of his bindle or the precious bag of cheap tobacco. He started to relax back onto the couch when a sound caught his attention even over the snoring of the others. It was a low wail, the sound of a man who can no longer control himself. Feldman swung to the cot on his left as the moan hacked off. The man there was well-fed and clean-shaven, but his face was gray with sickness. He was writhing and clutching his stomach, arching his back against the misery inside him. Space stomach, Feldman diagnosed. He had no need of the weak answering nod. He'd treated such cases several times in the past. The disease was usually caused by the absence of gravity out in space, but it could be brought on later from abuse of the weakened internal organs, such as the intake of too much bad liquor. The man must have been frequenting the wrong space-front bars. Now he was obviously dying. Violent peristaltic contractions seemed to be tearing the intestines out of him, and the paroxysms were coming faster. His eyes darted to Feldman's tobacco sack, and there was animal appeal in them. Feldman hesitated, then reluctantly rolled a smoke. He held the cigarette while the spaceman took a long, gasping drag on it. He smoked the remainder himself, letting the harsh tobacco burn against his lungs and sicken his empty stomach. Then he shrugged and threaded his way through the narrow aisles toward the attendant. "'Better get a doctor,' he said bitterly, when the young punk looked up at him. "'You've got a man dying of space stomach on 214.' The sneer on the kid's face deepened. Yeah, we don't pay for doctors every time some wino wants to throw up. Forget it and get back where you belong, Bo. You'll have a corpse on your hands in an hour, Feldman insisted. I know space stomach, damn it. The kid turned back to his lottery sheet. Go treat yourself if you want to play doctor. Go on, scram, before I toss you out in the snow. One of Feldman's white-knuckled hands reached for the attendant. Then he caught himself. He started to turn back hesitated, and finally faced the kid again. "'I'm not fooling. I was a doctor,' he stated. "'My name is Daniel Feldman.' The attendant nodded absently until the words finally penetrated. He looked up, studied Feldman with surprised curiosity and growing contempt, and reached for the phone. "'Give me medical directory,' he muttered. Feldman felt the kid's eyes on his back as he stumbled through the aisles to his cot again. He slumped down, rolling another cigarette in hands that shook. The sick man was approaching delirium now, and the moans were mixed with weak, whining sounds of fear. Other men had wakened and were watching, 
but nobody made a move to help the retching and writhing of the sick man had begun to weaken but it was still not too late to save him hot water and skilful massage could interrupt the paroxysms in fifteen minutes feldman could have stopped the attack completely he found his feet on the floor and his hands already reaching out savagely he pulled himself back sure he could save the man and wind up in the gas chamber there'd be no mercy for his second offence against lobby laws if the spaceman lived feldman might get off with a flogging that was standard punishment for a pariah who stepped out of line but with his luck there would be a heart arrest and another juicy story for the papers idealism the medical lobby made a lot out of the word but it wasn't for him a pariah had no business thinking of others as feldman sat there staring the spaceman grew quieter sometimes even at this stage massage could help it was harder without liberal supplies of hot water but the massage was the really important treatment it was the trembling of feldman's hands that stopped him he no longer had the strength or the certainty to make the massage effective he was glaring at his hands in self-disgust when the legal doctor arrived the man was old and tired probably he had been another idealist who had wound up defeated content to leave things up to the established procedures of the medical lobby he looked it as he bent over the dying man the doctor turned back at last to the attendant too late the best i can do is ease his pain the call should have been made half an hour earlier he had obviously never handled space stomach before he administered a hypo that probably held narconol. Feldman watched, his guts tightening sympathetically for the shock that would be to the sick man. But at least it would shorten his sufferings. The final seizure lasted only a minute or so. Hopeless, the doctor said. His eyes were clouded for a moment, and then he shrugged. Well, I'll make out a death certificate. Anyone here know his name? His eyes swung about the cots until they came to rest on Feldman. He frowned, and a twisted smile curved his lips. "'Feldman, isn't it? You still look something like your pictures. Do you know the deceased?' Feldman shook his head bitterly. "'No, I don't know his name. I don't even know why he wasn't cyanotic at the end. If it was Space Stomach. Do you, doctor?' The old man threw a startled glance at the corpse. Then he shrugged and nodded to the attendant. Well, I'll go through his things. If he still has a space ticket, I can get his name from that. The kid began pawing through the bag that had fallen from the cot. He dragged out a pair of shoes, half a bottle of cheap rum, a wallet, and a bronze space ticket. He wasn't quick enough with the wallet, and the doctor took it from him. Medical lobby authorization. If he has any money, it covers my fee, and the rest goes to his own lobby. There were several bills, all of large denominations. He turned the ticket over and began filling in the death certificate. Arthur Billings, Space Lobby, Crewman, Cause of Death, Idiopathic Gastroenteritis, and Delirium Tremens. There had been no evidence of Delirium Tremens, but apparently the doctor felt he had scored a point. He tossed the space ticket toward the shoes, closed his bag, and prepared to leave. "'Hey, Doc!' the attendant's voice was indignant. "'What about my reporting fee?' The doctor stopped. He glanced at the kid, then toward Feldman, his face a mixture of speculation and dislike. He took a dollar bill from the wallet. "'That's right,' he admitted. "'The fee for reporting a solvent case. Medical lobby rules apply.' even to a man who breaks them. The kid's hand was out, but the doctor dropped the dollar onto Feldman's cot. There's your fee, pariah. He left, forcing the protesting attendant to precede him. Feldman reached for the bill. It was blood money for letting a man die, but it meant cigarettes and food or shelter for another night if he could get a mission meal. He no longer could afford pride. Grimly, he pocketed the bill, staring at the face of the dead man. It looked back sightlessly, 
now showing a faint speckling of tiny dots. They caught Feldman's eyes, and he bent closer. There should be no black dots on the skin of a man who died of space stomach, and there should have been cyanosis. He swore and bent down to find the wrecks of his shoes. He couldn't worry about anything now but getting away from here before the attendant made trouble. His eyes rested on the shoes of the dead man, sturdy boots that would last for another year. They could do the corpse no good. Someone else would steal them if he didn't. But he hesitated, cursing himself. The right boot fitted better than he could have expected, but something got in the way as he tried to put the left one on. His fingers found the bronze ticket. He turned it over, considering it. He wasn't ready to fraud his identity for what he'd heard of life on the spaceships yet, but he shoved it into his pocket and finished lacing the boots. Outside the snow was still falling, but it had turned to slush and the sidewalk was soggy underfoot. There was going to be no work shoveling snow, he realized. This would melt before the day was over. Feldman hunched the suit coat up, shivering as the cold bit into him. The boots felt good, though. If he'd had socks, they would have been completely comfortable. He passed a cheap restaurant, and the smell of the synthetics set his stomach churning. It had been two days since his last real meal, and the dollar burned in his pocket. But he had to wait. There was a fair chance this early that he could scavenge something edible. He shuffled on. After a while the cold bothered him less, and he passed through the hunger spell. He rolled another smoke and sucked at it, hardly thinking. It was better that way. It was much later when the big caduceus set into the sidewalk snapped him back to awareness of where he had traveled. His undirected feet had led him much too far uptown following old habits. This was the medical lobby building where he'd spent more than enough time, including three weeks in custody before they stripped him of all rank and status. His eyes wandered to the ornate entrance where he'd first emerged as a pariah. He'd meant to walk down those steps as if he were still a man, but each step had drained his resolution until he'd finally covered his face and slunk off, knowing himself for what the world had branded him. He stood there now, staring at the smug young medical politicians and the tired old general practitioners filing in and out. One of the latter halted, fumbled in his pocket, and drew out a quarter. "'Merry Christmas,' he said dully. Feldman fingered the coin. Then he saw a gray medical policeman watching him, and he knew it was time to move on. Sooner or later, someone would recognize him here. He clutched the quarter and turned to look for a coffee shop that sold the synthetics to which his metabolism had been switched. No shop would serve him here, but he could buy coffee and a piece of cake to take out. A flurry of motion registered from the corner of his eye, and he glanced back. Taxi! Taxi! The girl rushing down the steps had a clear soprano voice, cultured and commanding. The gray medical uniform seemed molded to her shapely figure, and her red hair glistened in the lights of the street. Her snub nose and determined mouth weren't the current fashion, but nobody stopped to think of fashions when they saw her. She didn't have to be the daughter of the president of medical lobby to rule. It was Chris. Chris Feldman once, and now Chris Ryan again. Feldman swung toward a cab. For a moment his attitude was automatic and assured, and the cab stopped before the driver noticed his clothes. He picked up the bag Chris dropped and swung it onto the front seat. She was fumbling in her change purse as he turned back to shut the door. "'Thank you, my good man,' she said. She could be gracious, even to a pariah, when his homage suited her. She dropped two quarters into his hand, raising her eyes. Recognition flowed into them, followed by icy shock. She yanked the cab door shut and shouted something to the driver. The cab took off with a rush that left Feldman in a backwash of slush and mud. He glanced down at the coins in his hand. It was his lucky day, he thought bitterly. He moved across the street and away, not bothering about the squeal of brakes and the honking horns. 
he looked back only once toward the glowing sign that topped the building your health is our business then the great symbol of the health business faded behind him and he stumbled on sucking incessantly at the cigarettes he rolled one hand clutched the bronze badge belonging to the dead man and his stolen boots drove onward through the melting snow it was christmas in the year twenty one hundred on the protectorate of earth end of chapter one recording by thomas rose chapter two of badge of infamy by lester del rey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two lobby feldman had set his legs the problem of heading for the great spaceport and escape from earth and he let them take him without further guidance his mind was wrapped up in a whirl of the past his past and that of the whole planet both pasts had in common the growth and sudden ruin of idealism idealism throughout history some men had sought the ideal and most had called it freedom only fools expected absolute freedom but wise men dreamed up many systems of relative freedom including democracy they had tried that in america as the last fling of the dream it had been a good attempt too the men who drew the constitution had been pretty practical dreamers they came to their task after a bitter war and a worse period of wild chaos and they had learned where idealism stopped and idiocy began they set up a republic with all the elements of democracy that they considered safe it had worked well enough to make america the number one power of the world but the men who followed the framers of the new plan were a different sort without the knowledge of practical limits the privileges their ancestors had earned in blood and care became automatic rights practical men tried to explain that there were no such rights that each generation had to pay for its rights with responsibility that kind of talk didn't get far people wanted to hear about rights not about duties they took the phrase that all men were created equal and left out the implied kicker that equality was in the sight of god and before the law they wanted an equality with the greatest men without giving up their drive toward mediocrity and they meant to have it in a way they got it they got the vote extended to everyone a man on subsidy or public dole could vote to demand more the man who read nothing beyond sex crimes could vote on the great political issues of the world no ability was needed for his vote in fact he was assured that voting alone was enough to make him a fine and noble citizen he loved that if he bothered to vote at all that year he became a great man by listing his unthought hungry desire for someone to take care of him without responsibility so he went out and voted for the man who promised him most or who looked most like what his limited dreams felt to be a father image or son image or hero image he never bothered later to see how the men he'd elected had handled the jobs he had given them someone had to look of course and someone did organized special interests stepped in where the mob had failed lobbies grew up there had always been pressure groups but now they developed into a third arm of the government the old farm lobby was unbeatable the big farmers shaped the laws they wanted they convinced the little farmers it was for the good of all and they made the story stick well enough to swing the farm vote they made the laws when it came to food and crops the last of the great lobbies was space probably it was an accident that grew up so fast it never even knew it wasn't a real part of the government it developed during a period of chaos when another country called russia got the first hunk of metal above the atmosphere and when the representatives who had been picked for everything but their grasp of science and government went into panic over a myth of national prestige the space effort was turned over to the aircraft industry 
which had never been able to manage itself successfully except under the stimulus of war or a threat of war the failing airplane industry became the space combine overnight and nobody kept track of how big it was except a few sharp operators they worked out a system of subcontracts that spread the profits so wide that hardly a company of any size in the country wasn't getting a share thus a lot of patriotic noble voters got their pay from companies in the lobby block and could be panicked by the lobby at the first mention of recession so space lobby took over completely in its own field it developed enough pressure to get whatever appropriations it wanted even over presidential veto it created the only space experts which meant that men placed in government agencies to regulate it came from its own ranks the other lobbies learned a lot from space there had been a medical lobby long before but it had been a conservative group mostly concerned with protecting medical autonomy and ethics it also tried to prevent government control of treatment and payment feeling that it couldn't trust the people to know where to stop but its history was a long series of retreats it fought what it called socialized medicine but the people wanted their troubles handled free which meant by government spending since that could be added to the national debt and thus didn't seem to cost anything it lost and eventually the government paid most medical costs with doctors working on a fixed fee then quantity of treatment paid rather than quality competence no longer mattered so much the lobby lost but didn't know it because the lowered standards of competence in the profession lowered the caliber of men running the political aspects of that profession as exemplified by the lobby it took a worldwide plague to turn the tide the plague began in old china anything could start there with more than a billion people huddled in one area and a few madmen planning to conquer the world it might have been a laboratory mutation but nobody could ever prove it it wiped out two billion people depopulated africa and most of asia and wrecked europe leaving only america comparatively safe to take over an obscure scientist in one of the laboratories run by the medical lobby found a cure before the first waves of the epidemic hit america rutherford ryan then head of the lobby made sure that medical lobby got all the credit by the time the world recovered america ran it and the medical lobby was untouchable ryan made a deal with space lobby and the two effectively ran the world none of the smaller lobbies could buck them and neither could the government there was still a president and a congress as there had been a senate under the roman caesars but the two lobbies ran themselves as they chose the real government had become a kind of oligarchy as it always did after too much false democracy ruined the ideals of real and practical self-rule a man belonged to his lobby just as a serf had belonged to his feudal landlord it was a safe world now maybe progress had been halted at about the level of nineteen eighty but so long as the citizens didn't break the rules of their lobbies they had very little to worry about for that for security and the right not to think most people were willing to leave well enough alone some rules seemed harsh of course such as the law that all operations had to be performed in lobby hospitals but that could be justified it was the only safe kind of surgery and the only way to make sure there was no unsupervised experimentation such as that which supposedly caused the plague the rule was now an absolute ethic of medicine it also made for better fees feldman's father had stuck by the rule but had questioned it feldman learned not to question in medical school he scored second in medical ethics only to christina ryan he had never figured out why she singled him out for her attentions but he gloried in both those attentions and the results he became automatically a rising young man the favorite of the daughter of the lobby president he went through internship without a sign of trouble chris humored him in his desire to spend three years of practice in a poor section loaded with disease and her father approved 
such selfless dedication was the perfect image projection for a future son-in-law in return he agreed to follow that period by becoming an administrator a doctor's doctor as they put it they were married in april and his office was ready in may complete with a staff of eighty the publicity releases had gone out and the public relations lobby that handled news and education was paid to begin the greatest build-up any young genius ever had they celebrated that with a little party of some four hundred people and reporters at ryan's lodge in canada it was to be a gala weekend it was then that baxter shot himself baxter had been feldman's closest friend in the lobby he had come along to handle press relations and had gotten romantic about the countryside never having been out of a city before he hired a guide and went hunting eighty miles beyond the last outpost of civilization somehow he got his hand on a gun though only guides were supposed to touch them managed to overcome its safety devices and then pulled the trigger with the gun pointed the wrong way chris feldman and Harnett from Public Relations had accompanied him on the trip. They were sitting in a nearby car while Feldman enjoyed the scenery, Chris made further plans, and Harnett gathered material. There was also a photographer and writer, but they hadn't been introduced by name. Feldman reached Baxter first. The man was moaning and scared, and he was bleeding profusely. Only a miracle had saved him from instant death. The bullet had struck a rib, been deflected and robbed of some of its energy, and had barely reached the heart, but it had pierced the pericardium, as best Feldman could guess, and it could be fatal at any moment. He'd reached for a probe without thinking. Chris knocked his hand aside. She was right, of course. He couldn't operate outside a hospital. But they had no phone in the lodge where the guide lived, and no way to summon an ambulance. They'd have to drive Baxter back in the car, which would almost certainly result in his death. When Feldman seemed uncertain, Harnett had given his warning in a low but vehement voice. You touch him, Dan, and I'll spread it in every one of our media. I'll have to. It's the only way to retain public confidence. There'd be a leak with all the guides and others here, and we can't afford that. I like you. You have color. But touch that wound, and I'll crucify you. Chris added her own threats. She'd spent years making him the outlet for all her ambitions denied because women were still only second-rate members of medical lobby. She couldn't let it go now, and she was probably genuinely shocked. Baxter groaned again and started to bleed more profusely. There wasn't much equipment. Feldman operated with a pocket knife sterilized in a bottle of expensive scotch and only anodyne tablets in place of anesthesia. He got the bullet out and sewed up the wound with a bit of surgical thread he'd been using to tie up a torn good luck emblem. The photographer and the writer recorded the whole thing. Chris swore harshly and beat her fists against the bowl of a tree. But Baxter lived. He recovered completely, and was shocked at the heinous thing that had been done to him. They crucified Feldman. End of chapter 2 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 3 of Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 spaceman most crewmen lived rough ugly lives and usually short ones passengers and officers on the big tubs were given the equivalent of gravity in spinning compartments but the crews rode free the lucky crewmen lived through their accidents got space stomach now and then and recovered nobody cared about the others feldman's ticket was work stamped for the navajo and nobody questioned his identity he suffered through the agony of acceleration on the shuttle up to the orbital station, then was sick as acceleration stopped. But he was able to control himself enough to follow other crewmen down a hall of the station toward the Navajo. The big ships never touched a planet, always docking at the stations. A checker met the crew and reached for their badges. 
He barely glanced at them, punched a mark for each on his checkoff sheet, and handed them back. Deckman forward, tubemen to the rear, he ordered. Navajo blasts in fifteen minutes. Hey, you, your tubes! Feldman grunted. He should have expected it. Tubemen had the lowest lot of all the crew, between the killing work, the heat of the tubes, and occasional doses of radiation, their lives weren't worth the metal value of their tickets. He began pulling himself clumsily along a shaft, dodging freight the loaders were tossing from hand to hand. A bag hit his head, drawing blood, and another caught him in the groin. "'Watch it, Bo! a loader yelled at him. "'You dent that bag and they'll brig you. Can't you see it's got a special courtesy stripe?' It had a brilliant green stripe, he saw. It also had a name printed in block letters that shouted their identity before he could read the words, Dr. Christina Ryan, Southport, Mars. And he had to choose this time to leave Earth. Suddenly he was glad he was assigned to the tubes. It was the one place on the ship where he'd be least likely to run into her. As a doctor and a courtesy passenger, she'd have complete run of the ship, but she'd hardly bother with the dangerous and unpleasant tube section. He dragged his way back, beginning to sweat with the effort. The Navajo was an old ship, a lot of the handholds were missing, and he had to throw himself along by erratic leaps. He was gaining proficiency, but not enough to handle himself if the ship blasted off. Time was growing short when he reached the aft bunk room where the other tube men were waiting. Ben, one husky introduced himself. Tube chief. Know how to work this? Feldman could see that they were assembling a small still. He'd heard of the phenomenal quantities of beer spacemen drank, and now he realized what really happened to it. Hard liquor was supposed to be forbidden, but they made their own. I can work it, he decided. I'm, uh, Dan. Okay, Dan. Ben glanced at the clock. Hit the sack, boys. By the time Feldman could settle into the sack-like hammock, the Navajo began to shake faintly and weight piled up. It was mild compared to that on the shuttle, since the big ships couldn't take high acceleration. Space had been conquered for more than a century, but the ships were still flimsy tubs that took months to reach Mars using immense amounts of fuel. Only the valuable plant hormones from Mars made commerce possible at the ridiculously high freight rate. Three hours later, he began to find out why spacemen didn't seem to fear dying or turning pariah. The tube quarters had grown insufferably hot during the long blast, but the main tube room was blistering as Ben led the men into it. The chief handed out spacesuits and motioned for Dan. Greenhorn, ain't you? Okay, I'll take you with me. We go out in the tubes and pull the lining. I pry up the stuff, you carry it back here and stack it. They sealed off the tube room, pumped out the air, and went into the steaming, mildly radioactive tubes, just big enough for a man on hands and knees. Beyond the tube mouth was empty space, waiting for the man who slipped. Ben began ripping out the eroded blocks with a special tool. Feldman carried them back and stacked them along with others. A plasma furnace melted them down into new blocks. The work grew progressively worse as the distance to the tube room increased. The tube mouth yawned closer and closer. There were no handholds there, only the friction of a man's body in the tube. Life settled into a dull routine of labor, sleep, and the brief relief of the crude white mule from the still. They were six weeks out and almost finished with the tube cleaning when number two tube blew. Bits of the remaining radioactive fuel must have collected slowly until they reached blow point. Feldman, in number one, would have gone sailing out into space, but Ben reacted at once. As the ship leaped slightly, Feldman brought up sharply against the chief's braced body. For a second, their fate hung in the balance. Then it was over, and Ben shoved him back, grinning faintly. He jerked his thumb and touched helmets briefly. There they go, Dan. The two men who had been working in number two were charred lumps drifting out into space. No further comment was made on it, except that they'd have to work harder from now on since they were short-handed. That rest period Feldman came down with a mild attack of space stomach, 
which meant no more drinking for him, and was off work for a day. Then the pace picked up, the tubes were cleared, and they began laying the new lining for the landing blasts. There was no time for thought after that. Mars Orbital Station lay close when the work was finished. Ben slapped Feldman on the back. "'You ain't bad for a greenie, Dan. We all get six-day passes on Mars. Hit the sack now, so you won't waste time sleeping then. We'll hear it when the ship berths.' Feldman didn't hear it. But the others did. He felt Ben shaking his shoulder, trying to drag him out of the sack. "'Grab your junk, Dan!' Ben picked up Feldman's nearly empty bag and tossed it toward him before his eyes were fully open. He grabbed for it and missed. He grabbed again with Ben's laughter in his ears. The bag hit the wall and fell open, spilling its contents. Feldman began gathering it up, but the chief was no longer laughing. A big hand grabbed up the space ticket suddenly, and there was no friendliness now on Ben's face. "'Art Billings' card,' Ben told the other two men. Five trips I made with Art. He was saving his money, going to buy a farm on Mars. Five trips and one more to go before he had enough. Now you show up with his ticket. The tube men moved forward toward Feldman. There was no indecision. To them, apparently trial had been held and sentence passed. Wait a minute, Feldman began. Billings died of— A fist snaked past his raised hand and connected with his jaw. He bounced off a wall. A wrench sailed toward him, glanced off his arm, and ripped at his muscles. Another heavy fist struck. Abruptly, Ben's voice cut through their yells. Hold it! He shoved through the group, tossing men backwards. Stow it! We can take care of him later. Right now this is captain's business. You fools want to lose your leave? He indicated two of the others. You two bring him along and keep him quiet. The two grabbed Feldman's arms and dragged him along as the chief began pulling his way forward through the tubes up toward the control section of the ship. Feldman took a quick glance at their faces and made no effort to resist. They obviously would have enjoyed any chance to subdue him. They were stopped twice by minor officers, then sent on. They finally found the captain near the exit lock, apparently assisting the passengers to leave. Most of them went on into the shuttle, but Chris Ryan remained behind as the captain listened to Ben's report and inspected the false ticket. Finally the captain turned to Feldman. "'You! What's your name?' Chris's eyes were squarely on Feldman, cold and furious. He was Dr. Daniel Feldman, Captain Marker, she stated. Feldman stood paralyzed. He'd been unwilling to face Chris. He wanted to avoid all the past. But the idea that she would denounce him had never entered his head. There was no medical rule involved. She knew that as a pariah he was forbidden to board a passenger ship, of course. But she'd been his wife once. Marker bowed slightly to her. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I should take this criminal back to Earth in chains, I suppose, but he's hardly worth the freightage. You men, want to take him down to Mars and ground him there? Ben grinned and touched his forelock. Thank you, sir. We'd enjoy that. Good. His pay reverts to the ship's fund. That's all, men. Feldman started to protest, but a fist lashed savagely against his mouth. He made no other protests as they dragged him into the crew shuttle that took off for Southport. He avoided their eyes and sat hunched over. It was Ben who finally broke the silence. What happened to Art's money? He had a pile on him. Go to hell. Give, I said. Ben twisted his arm back toward his shoulder, applying increasing pressure. A doctor took it for his fee when Billings died of space stomach. Damn you, I couldn't help him. Ben looked at the others. Med lobby fee, huh? All the market'll take. Hmm. Could be, maybe. He shrugged. Okay, reasonable doubt. We won't kill you, Bo. Not quite, we won't. The shuttle landed and Ben handed out the little helmets and aspirators that made life possible in Mars's thin air. Outside, the tubemen took turns holding Feldman and beating him while the passengers disembarked from their shuttle. As he slumped into unconsciousness, he had a picture of Chris Ryan's frozen face 
as she moved steadily toward the port station. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 4 of Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Martian It was night when Feldman came to, and the temperature was dropping rapidly. He struggled to sit up through a fog of pain. Somewhere in his bag he should have an anodyne tablet that would kill any ache. He finally found the pill and swallowed it fumbling with the aspirator lip opening. The aspirator meant life to him now, he suddenly realized. He twisted to stare at the tiny charge indicator for the battery. It showed half charge. Then he saw that someone had attached another battery beside it. He puzzled briefly over it, but his immediate concern was for shelter. Apparently he was still where he had been knocked out. There was a light coming from the little station, and he headed toward that, fumbling for the few quarters that represented his entire fortune. Maybe it would have been better if the tubemen had killed him. Batteries were an absolute necessity here. Food and shelter would be expensive, and he had no skills to earn his way. At most, he had only a day or so left. But meantime, he had to find warmth before the cold killed him. The tiny restaurant in the station was still open, and the air was warm inside. He pulled off the aspirator, shutting off the battery. The counterman didn't even glance up as he entered. Feldman gazed at the printed menu and flinched. Soup, he ordered. It was the cheapest item he could find. The counterman stared at him, obviously spotting his earth origin. You adjusted to synthetics? Feldman nodded. Earth operated on a mixed diet with synthetics for all who couldn't afford the natural foods there, but Mars was all synthetic. Many of the chemicals in food could exist in either of two forms, or isomers. They were chemically alike, but differently crystallized. Sometimes either form was digestible, but frequently the body could use only the isomer to which it was adjusted. Martian plants produced different isomers from those on Earth. Since the synthetic foods turned out to be Mars normal, that was probably the more natural form. Research designed to let the early colonists live off native foods here had turned up an enzyme that enabled the body to handle either isomer. In a few weeks of eating Martian or synthetic food, the body adapted. Without more enzyme, it lost its power to handle Earth normal food. The cheapness of synthetics and the discovery that many diseases common to Earth would not attack Mars' normal bodies led to the wide use of synthetics on Earth. No pariah could have been expected to afford Earth normal. Feldman finished the soup and found a cigarette that was smokable. Any objections if I sit in the waiting room? He'd expected a rejection, but the counterman only shrugged. The waiting room was almost dark and the air was chilly but there was normal pressure. He found a bench and slumped onto it, lighting his cigarette. He'd missed the smokes, but probably not for long. He finished the cigarette reluctantly and sat huddled on the bench, waiting for morning. The airlock opened later and feet sounded on the boards of the waiting room floor, but he didn't look up until a thin beam of light hit him. Then he sighed and nodded. The shoes, made of some odd fiber, didn't look like those of a cop, but this was Mars. He could see only a hulking shadow behind the light. "'You the man who was a medical doctor?' The voice was dry and old. "'Yeah,' Feldman answered. "'Once. Good. Thought that space crewman was just lying drunk at first. Come along, Doc. Why, it didn't matter.' but if they wanted him to move on, they'd have to push a little harder. The light swung up to show the other. He was the shade of old leather with a bleached patch of sandy hair and the deepest gray eyes Feldman had ever seen. It was a face that could have belonged to a country storekeeper in New England with the same hint of dry humor. The man was dressed in padded Levi's and a leather jacket of unguessable age. 
His aspirator seemed worn and patched, and one big hand fumbled with it. "'Because we're friends, Doc,' the voice drawled at him. "'Because you might as well come with us as sit here. Maybe we have a job for you.' Feldman shrugged and stood up. If the man was a lobby policeman, he was different from the usual kind. Nothing could be worse than the present prospects. They went out through the doors of the waiting room toward a rattletrap vehicle. It looked something like a cross between a schoolboy's jalopy and a scaled-down army tank of former times. The treads were caterpillar style, and the stubby body was completely enclosed. A tiny airlock stuck out from the rear. Two men were inside both bearded. The old man grinned at them. Mark, Lou, meet Doc Feldman. Sit, Doc, I'm Jake Mullins, and you might say we were farmers. The motor started with a wheeze. The tractor swung about and began heading away from Southport toward the desert dunes. It shook and rattled, but it seemed to make good time. I don't know anything about farming, Feldman protested. Jake shrugged. No, of course not. Couple of our friends heard about you where a spaceman was getting drunk and tipped us off. We know who you are. Here, try a bracky. Feldman took what seemed to be a cigarette and studied it doubtfully. It was coarse and fibrous inside with a thin, hard shell that seemed to be a natural growth as if it had been chopped from some vine. He lighted it, not knowing what to expect. Then he coughed as the bitter, rancid smoke burned at his throat. He started to throw it down, and hesitated. Jake was smoking one, and it had killed the craving for tobacco almost instantly. "'Some like em, most don't,' Jake said. "'They won't hurt you. Look, see that? Old Martian ruins, built by some race a million years ago, only half a dozen on Mars.' It was only a clump of weathered stone buildings in the light from the tractor, and Feldman had seen better in the stereo shots. It was interesting only because it connected with the legendary Martian race, like the canals that showed from space but could not be seen on the surface of the planet. Feldman waited for the other to go on, but Jake was silent. Finally he ground out the butt of the weed. Okay, Jake, what do you want with me? consultation maybe ever hear of herb doctors i'm one of em feldman knew that the lobby permitted some leniency here due to the scarcity of real medical help there was only one decent hospital at northport on the opposite side of the planet jake sighed and reached for another bracky weed yeah i'm pretty good with herbs but i got a sick village on my hands and i can't handle it we can't all mortgage our work to pay for a trip to Northport. Southport's all messed up while the new she-doctor gets her metabolism changed. Maybe the old guy there would have helped, but he died a couple of months ago. So it looks like you are our only hope. Then you have no hope, Feldman told him sickly. I'm a pariah, Jake. I can't do a thing for you. We heard about your argument with the lobby. News reaches Mars. But these are mighty sick people, Doc. Feldman shook his head. Better take me back. I'm not allowed to practice medicine. The charge would be first-degree murder if anything happened. Lou leaned forward. Shall I talk to him, Jake? The old man grimaced. Time enough. Let him see what we got first. Sand howled against the windshield, and the tractor bumped and surged along. Feldman took another of the weeds and tried to estimate their course, but he had no idea where they were when the tractor finally stopped. There was a village of small huts that seemed to be merely entrances to living quarters dug under the surface. They led him into one, and through a tunnel, into a large room filled with simple cots and the unhappy sounds of sick people. Two women were disconsolately trying to attend to the half-dozen sick, four children, and two adults. Their faces brightened as they saw Jake, then fell. Eb and Tilda died, they reported. Feldman looked at the two figures under the sheets and whistled. The same black specks he had seen on the face of Billings covered the skins of the two old people who had died. Funny, Jake said slowly. 
They didn't quite act like the others, and they sure died mighty fast. Darn it, I had it figured for that stuff in the book, infantile paralysis. How about it, Doc? Sort of like a cold, stiff, sore neck? It was clearly polio, one of the diseases that could attack Mars' normal flesh. Feldman nodded at the symptoms, staring at the sick kids. He shrugged finally. There's a cure for it, but I don't have the serum. Neither do you, or you wouldn't have brought me here. I couldn't help if I wanted to. That old book didn't list a cure, Jake told him, but it said the kids didn't have to be crippled. There was something about a Kenny treatment. Doc, does the stuff really cripple for life? Feldman saw one of the boys flinch. He dropped his eyes, remembering the lobby's efficient spy service on Earth and wondering what it was like here, but he knew the outcome. "'Damn you, Jake!' Jake chuckled. "'Thought you would. We sure appreciate it. Just tell us what to do, Doc.' Feldman began writing down his requirements, trying to remember the details of the treatment. Exercise, hot compresses, massage. It was coming back to him. He'd have to do it himself, of course, to get the feel of it. He couldn't explain it well enough. But he couldn't turn his back on the kids, either. "'Maybe I can help,' he said doubtfully, as he moved toward a cot. "'No, Doc.' Jake's voice wasn't amused any longer, and he held the younger man back. "'You're doing us a favor, and I'll be darned if I let you stick your neck out too far. You can't treat him yourself. Mars is tougher than Earth.' You should live under space lobby and medical lobby here a while. Oh, maybe they don't mind a few fools like me being herb doctors, but they'd sure hate to have a man who can do real medicine outside their hands. You let me do it, or get in the tractor and I'll have Lou drive you back. Once you start in here, there'll be no stopping, believe me. Feldman looked at him, seeing the colonials around him for the first time as people. It had been a long time since he'd been treated as a fellow human by anyone. Jake was right, he knew. Once he put his hand to the bandage, eventually there'd be no turning back from the scalpel. These people needed medical help too desperately. Eventually, the news would spread, and the lobby police would come for him. Chris couldn't afford to shield him. In fact, he was sure now that she'd hunt him night and day. "'Don't be a fool, Jake,' he ordered brusquely. He handed his list to one of the women. "'You'll have to learn to do what I do,' he told the people there. "'You'll have to work like fools for weeks. But there won't be many crippled children. I can promise you that much.' He blinked sharply at the sudden hope in their eyes, but his mind went on wondering how long it would be before the inevitable would catch up with him. With luck, maybe a few months— but he hadn't been blessed with any superabundance of luck. It would probably be less time than he thought. End of chapter 4 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 5 of Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Surgery Doc Feldman's luck was better than he had expected. For an earth year he was a doctor again, moving about from village to village as he was needed and doing what he could. The village had been isolated during the early colonization when Mars made a feeble attempt to break free of space lobby. Their supplies had been cut off, and they had been forced to do for themselves. Now they were largely self-sufficient. They grew native plants and extracted hormones in crude little chemical plants. The hormones were traded to the big chemical plants for a pittance to buy what had to come from Earth. Other jury-rigged affairs synthesized much of their food, but mostly they learned to get along on what Mars provided. Doc Feldman learned from them. Money was no longer a part of his life. He ate with whatever family needed him and slipped into the life around him. He was learning Martian medicine and finding that his earth courses were mostly useless. No wonder the villagers distrusted lobby doctors. Doc had his own little laboratory where he had managed to start making Mars normal penicillin, a primitive antibiotic 
but better than nothing. Jake had come to remind him that it was his first anniversary, and now they were smoking bracky together. Sheer luck, Jake, Doc repeated. You Martians are tough, but some day someone is going to die under my care with the little equipment I have, and then... Jake nodded slowly. Maybe, Doc, and maybe some day Mars will break free of the lobbies. You'd better pray for that. I've been... Doc stopped, realizing what he'd started to say. The old man chuckled. You've been talking rebellion for months, Doc. I hear rumors. Whenever you get mad, you want us to secede. But you don't really mean it yet. You can't picture any government but the one you're used to. Doc grinned. Jake had a point, but it was not as strong as it would have been a few months before. The towns under the lobby were cheap imitations of Earth, but here, divorced to a large extent from the lobbies, the villages were making Mars their own. Their ways might be strange, but they worked. Jake shifted his body in the weak sunlight. Newton Village forgot to report a death on time. I hear Ryan is sweating him out, trying to prove it was your fault. There was no evidence against him yet, Doc was sure. But Chris was out to prove something, and to get a reputation as a top-flight administrator. It must have hurt when they shipped her here as head of the lesser hemisphere of Mars. She had expected to use Feldman as a front while she became the actual ruler of the whole lobby. Now she wanted to strike back. She's using blackmail, he said, and some of his old bitterness was in his voice. Anyone taking treatment from an herb doctor in this section is cut off from medical lobby service. Damn it, Jake, that could mean letting people die. Yeah, Jake sighed softly. It could mean letting people begin to think about getting rid of the lobby, too. Well, I gotta help harvest the bracky. Take it easy on operating for a while, will you, Doc? All right, Jake. But stop keeping the serious cases a secret. Two men died last month because you wouldn't call me for surgery. I've broken all my oaths already. It doesn't matter any more. It matters, boy. We've been lucky. But some day one case will go to the hospital and they'll find your former work. Then they'll really be after you. The less you do, the better. Doc watched Jake slump off then turned down into the little root cellar and back toward the room concealed behind it where his crude laboratory lay. For the moment he was free to work on the mystery of the black spots. He kept running into them, always on the body of someone who died of something that seemed like a normal disease. Without a microscope he was almost helpless, but he had taken specimens and tried to culture them. Some of his cultures had grown, though they might be nothing but unknown Martian fungi or bacteria. Mars was dry and almost devoid of air, but plants and a few smaller insects had survived and adapted. It wasn't by any means lifeless. Without a microscope he could do little but depend on his files of cases, but today there was new evidence. A villager had filched an Earth medical journal from the tractor driven by Chris Ryan and forwarded it to him. He found the black specks mentioned in a single paragraph under skin diseases. Investigation of the diet was being made, since all cases were among people eating synthetics. There was another article on aberrant cases, a few strange little misbehaviors and classical syndromes. He studied that, wondering. It had to be the same thing. Diet didn't account for the fact that the specks appeared only when the patient was near death, nor did it account for the hard lump at the base of the neck which he found in every case he could check. That might be coincidence, but he doubted it. Whatever it was, it aggravated any other disease the patient had and made seemingly simple diseases turn out to be completely and rapidly fatal. Once syphilis had been called the great imitator. This gave promise of being worse. He shook his head, cursing his lack of equipment. Each month more people were dying with these specks, and he was helpless. The concealed door broke open suddenly, and a boy thrust his head in. Doc, there's a man here from Einstein. Says his wife's dying. The man was already coming into the room. 
She's powerful sick, Doc. Had a belly ache, fever, began throwing up, pains under her belly like she's had before, but this time it's awful. Doc shot a few questions at him, frowning at what he heard. Then he began packing the few things that might help. There should be no appendicitis on Mars. The bugs responsible for that shouldn't have adapted to Mars normal. But more and more infections found ways to cross the border. Gangrene had been able to get by without change, it seemed. So far, none of the contagious infections except polio and the common cold had made the jump. This sounded like an advanced case, perhaps already involving peritonitis. So far he'd been lucky with penicillin, but each time he used it with grave doubts of its action on the Mars-adapted patients. If the appendix had burst, however, it was the only possible treatment. He riffled through his stores. There was ether enough, fortunately. The villagers had made that for him out of Martian plants using their complicated fermentation processes. He yelled for Jake, and the boy brought the old man back a moment later. "'Jake, I'll need more of that narcotic stuff. I don't want the woman writhing and tearing her stitches after the ether wears off.' "'Can't get it, Doc,' Jake's eyes seemed to cloud as he said it. "'Distilling plant broke down. Doc, I don't like this case. That woman's been to the hospital three times. I hear she just got out recently. This might be a plant, or they figure they can't help her.' They're afraid to try anything on Mars' normal flesh. They can't be proved wrong if they do nothing. Doc finished packing his bag and got ready to go out. Jake, either I'm a doctor or I'm not. I can't worry when a woman may be dying. For a second, Jake's expression was stubborn. Then the little crow's feet around his eyes deepened, and the dry chuckle was back in his voice. Right, Dr. Feldman. He flipped up his thumb and went off at a shuffling run towards the tractor. Lou and the man from Einstein followed Doc into the machine. It was a silent ride, except for Doc's questions about the sick woman. Her husband, George Lynn, was evasive and probably ignorant. He admitted that Harriet had been to the dispensary and small infirmary that Southport called a hospital. It was the only place in the entire southern hemisphere where an operation could be performed legally. Most cases had to go to Northport, but Chris had been trying to expand. Apparently she was determined to make Southport into another major center before she was called back to Earth. Doc wondered why the villagers went there. They had no medical insurance with the lobby. They couldn't afford it. Most villagers didn't have the cash either. They were forced to mortgage their future work and that of their families to the drug plants that were run by the lobby. "'And they just turned your wife away?' Doc asked. He couldn't quite believe that of Chris. Well, I don't know. She wouldn't talk much. Twice she went, and they gave her something. Cost every cent I could borrow. Then this last time they kept her a couple of days before they let me come and get her. But now she's a lot worse. Jake spun around suddenly tense. How did you pay em last time, George? Why, they didn't ask. I told her she could put up six months for me and the kids, but nobody said nothing about it. Just gave her back to me. He frowned slowly, his dull voice uncertain. They told me they'd done all they could not to bring her back. That's why she was so strong on getting Doc. I don't like it, Jake said flatly. It stinks. They always charge. George, did they suggest she get in touch with Doc here? Maybe they did, maybe not. Harriet did all the talking with them. I just do what she tells me, and she said to get Doc. Jake swore. It smells like a trap. Are you sure she's sick, George? I felt her head, and she sure had a fever. George Lynn was torn between his loyalties. You know me, Doc. You fixed me up that time I had the red pip. I wouldn't pull nothing on you. Doc had a feeling that Jake was probably right, but he vetoed the suggestion that they stop to look for spies. He had no time for that. If the woman was really sick, he had to get to her at once, and even that might be too late. He remembered the woman, sickly from other treatment. He'd been forced to remove her inflamed tonsils a few months before. She'd whined and complained because he couldn't spend all his time attending her. She was a nag, a shrew, and a totally selfish woman. But that was her husband's worry, not his.' 
He dashed into the little house when they reached Einstein, and his first glance confirmed what George Lynn had said. The woman was sick, all right. She was running a high fever. Much too high. She began whining and protesting at his having taken so long, but the pain soon forced her to stop. "'There may still be a chance,' Doc told her husband brusquely. He threw the cleanest sheet onto a table and shoved it under the single light. "'Keep out of the way. In the other room, if you can all pile in there. This isn't exactly aseptic anyhow. You can boil a lot of water if you want to help.' It would give them something to do, and he could use the water to clean up. There was no time to wait for it, however. He had to sterilize with alcohol and carbolic acid and hope. He bent over the woman, ripping her thin gown across to make room for the operation. Then he swore. Across her abdomen was the unhealed wound of a previous operation. They'd worked on her at Southport. They must have removed the appendix and then been shocked by the signs of infection. They weren't supposed to release a sick patient, but there was an easy out for them. They could remove her from the danger of spreading an unknown infection. Some doctors must have doped her up on sedatives and painkillers and sent her home, knowing that she would call for him. For that matter, they might have noticed her unrecorded tonsillectomy and considered her fair bait. He grabbed the ether and slapped a cone over her nose. She tried to protest. She never cooperated in anything. But the fumes of the ether he dipped onto the packing of the cone soon overcame that. It was peritonitis, of course. The only thing to do was go in and scrape and clean as best he could. It was a rotten job to have to do, and he should have had help. But he gritted his teeth and began. He couldn't trust anyone else to hold the instruments, even. He cleaned the infection as best he could, knowing there was almost no chance. He used all the penicillin he dared. Then he began sewing up the incision. It was all he could do, except for dressing the wound with a sterile bandage. He reached for one and stopped. While he'd been working, the woman had died, far more quietly than she had ever lived. It was probably the only gracious act of her life, but it was damning to Doc. They couldn't hide her death, and any investigation would show that someone had worked on her. To the lobby, he would be the one who had murdered her. Jake was waiting in the tractor. He took one look at Doc's face and made no inquiries. They were more than a mile away when Jake pointed back. Small in the distance, but distinct against the sands, a gray medical corps tractor was coming. Either they'd have a spy in the village, or they'd guess the rate of her infection very closely. They must have hoped to catch Doc in the act, and they'd barely missed. It wouldn't matter. Their pictures and what testimony they could force from the village should be enough to hang Doc. End of chapter 5 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 6 of Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Research There had been a council the night following the death of Harriet Lynn. Somehow the word had spread through the villages, and the chiefs had assembled in Jake's village. But they had brought no solution, and in the long run had been forced to accept Doc's decision. "'I'm not going to retire and hide,' he told them, surprised at his own decision, but grimly determined. "'You need me, and I need you. I'll move every day in hopes the lobby police won't find me, but I won't quit.' Now he was packing the things he most needed and getting ready to move. The small bottles in which he was trying to grow his cultures would need warmth. He shoved them into an inner pocket and began surveying what must be left. He was heading for his tractor when another battered machine drove up. It had a girl of about fourteen with tears streaming down her face. She held out a pleading hand, and her voice was scared. It's... it's Mama. Where? Uh, Leibniz. Leibniz was near enough. Doc started his tractor, motioning for the girl to lead the way. 
the little dwelling she led him to was at the edge of the village looking more poverty-stricken than most chris ryan and three of the medical lobby police were inside waiting the girl's mother was tied to the bed with a collection of medical instruments laid out but apparently the threat had been enough no actual injury had been inflicted probably none had been intended seriously i knew you'd answer that kind of call chris said coldly he grinned sickly they'd wasted no time i hear it's more than you'll do chris congratulations my patient died you're lucky she was certainly dead when my men took her picture the print shows the death grimace clearly pretty frame it and keep it to comfort you when you feel lonely he snapped she struck him across the mouth with the handle of her gun then she twisted out through the door quickly heading for the tractor that had been camouflaged to look like those used by the villagers three police led him behind her a shout went up and people began to rush onto the village street but they were too late by the time they reached southport doc could see a trail of battered tractors behind but there was nothing more the people could do chris had her evidence and her prisoner judge ben wilson might have been jake's brother he was older and grayer but the same expression lay on his face he must have been the family black sheep since his father had been president of space lobby instead of inheriting the position wilson had remained on mars safely out of the family's way he dropped the paper he was reading to frown at chris this the fellow she began formal charges but he cut them off your lawyer already had all that drawn up i've been expecting you doctor doctor <laughs> you'd do a lot better home somewhere raising a flock of babies well young fellow so you're feldman okay your trial comes up day after tomorrow be ashamed to lock you in southport jail a man of your importance we'll just keep you here in the pending trial room it's a lot more comfortable Chris had been boiling slowly, and now she seemed to blow her safety valve. Judge Wilson, your methods are your own business in local affairs, but this involves Earth Medical Lobby. I demand— The judge stared at her reprovingly. Young woman, you don't demand anything. This is Mars. If Space Lobby can stand me, I guess our friends over at Medical will have to. Or should I hold trial right now and find Feldman innocent for lack of evidence? you wouldn't chris cried then her face sobered suddenly i apologize medical is pleased to leave things in your hands of course wilson smiled court's closed for today doc i'll show you your cell it's right next to my study so i'm heading there anyhow he began shucking his robe while chris went out with the police her voice sharp and continual the cell was both reasonably escape-proof and comfortable doc saw and he tried to thank the judge but the old man waved it aside forget it i just like to see that little termagant taken down but don't count on my being soft my methods may be a bit unusual i always did like the courtroom scenes in the old books by that fella smith but space lobby never had any reason to reverse my decisions anything you need sure doc told him grinning in spite of his bitterness a good biology lab and an electron microscope um how about a good optical mic and some stains just got them in on the last shipment figure they were meant for you anyhow since jake mullins asked me to order them he went out and came back with the box almost at once he snorted at doc's incredulous thanks and moved off his bedroom slippers slapping against the hard floor doc stared after him if he were a friend of jake willing to invent some excuse to get a microscope here but it didn't matter friend or foe his death sentence would be equally fatal and there were other things to be thought of now the little microscope was an excellent one though only a monocular doc's hands trembled as he drew his cultures out and began making up a slide the sun offered the best source of light near the window and he adjusted the instrument something began to come into view but too faintly to be really visible he remembered the stains trying to recall his biology courses more by luck than skill his fourth try gave him results under two thousand power he could just see details 
there were dozens of cells in his impure culture but only one seemed unfamiliar it was a long worm-like thing sharpened at both ends with the three separate nuclei that were typical of martian life forms nearby were a host of little rod-like squiggles just too small to see clearly martian life no martian bug had ever proved harmful to men yet this was no mutated cell or virus from earth it was a new disease completely different from all others it was one where all earth's centuries of experience with bacteria would be valueless the first martian disease unless this was simply some accidental contamination of his culture not common to the other samples he worked on until the light was too faint before putting the microscope aside by the time the trial commenced however he was sure of the cause of the disease it was martian crude as his cultures were they had proved that the little courtroom was filled mostly from the villages lou was there along with others he had come to know then the sight of jake caught doc's eyes the darn fool had no business there he could get too closely mixed into the whole mess carts in session wilson announced doc you represented by counsel jake's voice answered your honor i represent the defendant i think you'll find my credentials in order chris started to protest but wilson grinned never lost your standing in spite of that little fracas thirty years ago so far as i know but the police thought you were a witness when you came walking in figured you were given up i never said so jake answered chris was squirming angrily but the florid man acting as counsel for medical lobby shook his head bending over to whisper in her ear he straightened no objection to counsel for the defense we recognize his credentials you're a fool matthews the judge told him jake was smarter than half the rest of legal lobby before he went native still can tie your tail to a can okay let's start things i'm too old to dawdle doc lost track of most of what happened this was totally unlike anything on earth though it might have been in keeping with the general casualness of the villages maybe the ritualistic routine of the lobbies was driving those who could resist to the opposite extreme chris was the final witness matthews drew comment of feldman's former crime from her and jake made no protest though wilson seemed to expect one then she began sewing his shroud there wasn't a fact that managed to emerge without slanting though technically correct jake sat quietly smiling faintly and making no protests he got up lazily to cross-examine chris dr ryan when daniel feldman was examined by the captain of the navajo after arriving at mars station did you identify him then as having been dr daniel feldman she glanced at matthews who seemed puzzled but unconcerned that's correct she admitted but and you later saw him delivered to the surface of mars is that also correct when she assented jake hesitated then he frowned what did you do then did you report him or send anyone to look after him or anything like that certainly not she answered he was no you did absolutely nothing about him after you identified him and saw him delivered here you're quite sure of that i did nothing jake stood quietly for a moment then shrugged no more questions matthews finished things in a plea for the salvation of all humanity from the danger of such men as daniel feldman he was looking smug as was chris wilson turned to jake has the defense anything to say a few things your honor jake stood up suddenly looking certain and pleased we are happy to admit everything factual the lobby has testified daniel feldman performed a surgical operation on harriet lynn in the village of einstein but when has it been illegal for a member of the medical profession to perform an operation even with small chance of success within an accepted area for such operation there has been no evidence adduced that any crime or act of even unethical conduct was committed that brought chris and matthews to their feet 
Wilson was relaxed again, looking as if he'd swallowed a whole cage of canaries. He banged his gavel down. Jake picked up two ragged and dog-eared volumes from his table. Case of Harding v. Southport, 2043, establishes that a lobby is responsible for any member on Mars. It is also responsible for informing the authorities of any criminal conduct on the part of its members or any former member known to it. Failure to report shall be considered an admission that the lobby recognizes the member as one in good standing and accepts responsibility for that member's conduct. At the time Daniel Feldman arrived, Dr. Christina Ryan was the highest appointed representative of medical lobby in Southport with full authority. She identified Feldman as having been a doctor, without stipulating any change in status. She made no further report to any authority concerning Daniel Feldman's presence here. It seems obvious that medical lobby at Southport thereby accepted Daniel Feldman as a doctor in good standing for whose conduct the lobby accepted full responsibility. Wilson studied the book Jake held out and nodded. Seems pretty clear-cut to me, he agreed, passing the book on to Matthews. There's still the charge that Dr. Feldman operated outside a hospital. No reason he shouldn't, Jake said. He handed over the other volume. This is the charter for medical lobby on Mars. Medical lobby agrees to perform all necessary surgical and medical services for the planet, though at the signing of this charter there was no hospital on Mars. Necessarily, medical lobby agreed to perform surgery outside of any hospital then. But to make it plainer, there's a later paragraph, page 181, that defines each hospital zone as extending not less than three nor more than one hundred miles. Einstein is about one hundred and ten miles from the nearest hospital at Southport, so Einstein comes under the original charter provisions. Dr. Feldman was forced by charter provisions to protect the good name of his lobby by undertaking any necessary surgery in Einstein. He waited until Matthews had scanned that book then took it back and began packing a big bag. Doc saw that his possessions and microscope were already in the bag. The old man paid no attention to the arguments of Matthews before the bench. Abruptly, Wilson pounded his gavel. This court finds that Dr. Daniel Feldman is qualified to practice all the arts and skills of the medical profession on Mars, and that he acted ethically in the performance of his duties in the case of the deceased Harriet Lynn, he ruled. The costs of the case shall be billed to medical lobby of Southport. He took off his robe and moved rapidly toward his private quarters. Court was closed. Doc got up shakily, not daring to believe fully what he had heard. He started toward Jake, trying to avoid bumping into Chris, but she would not be avoided. She stood in front of him, screaming accusations and threats that reminded him of the only fight they'd ever had during their brief marriage. When she ran down, he finally met her eyes. "'You're a hell of a doctor,' he told her harshly. "'You spend all your time fighting me when there's a plague out there that may be worse than any disease we've ever known. Take a look at what lies under the black specks on your corpses. You'll find the first Martian disease.' And maybe, if you begin working on that now, you can learn to be a real doctor in time to do something about it. But I doubt it. She fell back from him then. Research. You've been doing unauthorized research. Prove it, he suggested. But you'd be a lot smarter to try some yourself and to hell with your precious rules. He followed Jake out to the tractor. Surprisingly, the old man was sweating now. He shook his head at Doc's look, and his grin was uncertain. "'Matthews is an incompetent,' he said. "'They could have had you, Doc. That charter is so sloppy a man can prove anything by it, and building a hospital here did bring in Earth rules. Wilson went out on a limb letting you go, but I guess we got away with it. Let's get out of here.' Doc climbed into the tractor more soberly. They had escaped this time. But there would be another time, and he was pretty sure that would be Chris's round. He had no intention of giving up his research. End of chapter 6
Recording by Thomas Rose. Chapter Seven of Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven Plague. Dr. Feldman leaned back from his microscope and lighted another bracky weed. He glanced about the room and sighed wearily. Maybe he'd been better off when he had no friends and couldn't risk the safety of others in an effort to do research that was the highest crime on two worlds. The evidence of his work was hidden thirty feet beyond his former laboratory in Jake's village with a tunnel that led from another root cellar. The theory was the old one, that the best place to avoid discovery was where you had already been discovered. If their spies had identified his former hangout, they'd never expect to have him set up research nearby. It was a nice theory, but he wasn't sure of it. Jake looked up from a cot where he'd been watching the improvised culture incubator. "'Stop tearing yourself to bits, Doc. We know the danger, and we're still darn glad to have you here working on this.' I'm trying to put myself together into a whole man, Doc told him, but I seem to come out wholly a fool. Yeah, sure. Sometimes it takes a fool to get things done. Wise men wait too long for the right time. How's the bug hunt? Doc grunted in disgust and swung back to the microscope. Then he gave up as his tired eyes refused to focus. Why don't you people revolt? They tried it twice. But they were just a bunch of pariahs shipped here to live in peonage. They couldn't do much. The first time Earth cut off shipments and starved them. Next time the villages had the answer to that, but the cities had to fight for Earth or starve, so they whipped us. And there's always the threat that Earth could send over unmanned war rockets loaded with fissionables. So it's hopeless? So nothing! The lobbies are poisoning themselves like cutting off medical service until they cut themselves out of a job. It's just a matter of time. Go back to the bugs, Doc. Doc sighed and reached for his notes. I wish I knew more Martian history. I've been wondering whether this bug may not have been what killed off the old Martians. Something had to do it the way they disappeared. I wish I knew enough to make an investigation of those ruins out there. Derwood! Jake had propped himself up on an elbow, staring at Doc in surprise. Doc scowled. Clive Derwood, you mean? The archaeologist who dug up what little we know about the ruins? Yeah, before he went back to Earth and started living off his lectures. He came here again three years ago and dropped dead in Edison on the way to some other ruins. Heart failure, they called it, though it was more like the two old farmers who ran themselves to death last month. I saw him when they buried him. His face looked funny, and I think he had those little specks, though I may remember wrong. He grimaced. Mars is tough, Doc. It has to be. Some of the plant seeds Derwood found in the ruins grew. Maybe your bugs waited a million years until we came along. What about the farmers? Did they meet Derwood? Jake nodded. Must have. He lived in their village most of the time. Doc went through his notes. He'd asked for reports on all deaths, and he finally found the account. The two old men had been nervous and fidgety for weeks. They were twins, living by themselves, and nobody paid much attention. Then one morning both were seen running wildly in circles. The village managed to tie them up, but they died of exhaustion shortly after. It wasn't a pretty picture. The disease might have an incubation period of nearly fifteen years, judging by the length of time it had taken to hit Derwood. It must spread from person to person during an early contagious stage, leaving widening circles behind Derwood and those first infected. When matured, any other sickness would set it off with few symptoms of its own, but without help it still killed its victims apparently driving them madly toward frenzied physical effort. He studied the culture on a slide again. He tried Koch's method to get a pure strain, splattering the bugs onto a native starchy root and plucking off individual colonies. About twenty specimens had been treated with every chemical he could find. So far he'd found a few things that seemed to stop their growth, but nothing that killed them except stuff far too harsh to use in living tissue. 
He had nearly forty cases of deaths that showed symptoms now, and he went back over them, looking for anything in common that went back ten to twenty years before death. There were no rashes or blisters. A few had had apparent colds, but such were too common to mean anything. Only one thing appeared, about fourteen years before their deaths. The people interviewed about the victims might be vague about most things, but they remembered the time when Jim had the jumping headache. Jake, Doc called. What's jumping headache? Most people seem to have it some time or other, but I haven't run across a case of it. Sure you have, Doc. Maybe Brander's little girl a few weeks ago. Feels like your pulse is gonna rip your skull off right here. Can't eat because chewing drives you crazy. Back of your head, neck and shoulders swell up for about a week. Then it goes away. Then it goes away. For fourteen years, until it comes back to kill. Doc stared at his charts in sudden horror. It was a new disease, thought to be some virus, but not considered dangerous. Selznick's migraine, according to medical usage. You treated it with hot pads and anodyne, and it went away easily enough. He'd seen hundreds of such cases on Earth. There must be millions who had been hit by it. The patent medicine branch of the lobby had even brought out something called no-grain to use for self-treatment. Something important? Jake wanted to know. Feldman nodded. How much weight do you swing in other villages, Jake? People sort of do me favors when I ask, Jake admitted. Like swiping those medical journals from Northport for you, or like Molly Badger getting that job as maid to spy on Chris Ryan. Name it, I'll do my best. Doc had a vague idea of village politics, but he had more important things to think of. Most of his foul mood had disappeared with the clue he'd stumbled on, and his chief worry now was to clinch the facts. Feldman considered the problem. I want to report on every case of jumping headache in every village. Who had it, when, and how old they were. This place first, but every village you can reach. And I'll want someone to take a letter to Chris Ryan. Jake frowned at that, but went out to issue instructions. Doc sat down at a battered old typewriter. Writing Chris might do no good, but some warning had to be gotten through to Earth where the vast resources of medical lobby could be thrown into the task of finding the cause and cure of the disease. The connection with Selznick's migraine had to be reported. If something could blast the lobby into action, it wouldn't matter quite so much what they did to him. He wasn't foolish enough to expect gratitude from them, but he was getting used to the idea that his days were numbered. The plague was more important than what happened to him. The letter had been dispatched by the time Jake returned. Here's the dope for this village. Everybody's accounted for except you. Never had it, Jake, Feldman went down the list. Most of it fourteen years ago. That fits. About the only exceptions are the kids who seem to get it between the ages of two and three. Eighty-seven out of ninety-one. He stared at the figures sickly. Most of the village not only had the plague, but must be near the end of the incubation period. It looked as if most of the village would be dead before another year passed. Bad? Jake asked. The first symptom of Martian fever. The old man whistled the lines around his eyes, tightening. Must be me, he decided. I'm the guy who must have brought it here then. I used to spend a lot of time with Durwood at his diggings. There was a constant commotion all that day and the next as runners went out to the villages and came back with reports. The variation from village to village was only slight. Most of Mars seemed to have advanced cases of Martian fever. Without animals for investigation and study, real research was difficult. Doc also needed an electron microscope. He was reasonably sure that the disease must travel through the nerves, but he had found no proof beyond the hard lump at the base of the neck. There it was a fair-sized organism. Elsewhere he could find nothing, until the black specks developed. His eyes ached from trying to see more than was visible in the microscope. The tantalizing suggestions of filaments around the nuclei might be the form of the plague that was contagious. They might even be the true form of the bug, with the bigger cell only a transition stage. 
There were a number of diseases that involved complicated changes in the organisms that caused them, but he couldn't be sure. He finally buried his head in his hands, trying to do by pure thought what he couldn't do any other way, and even there he lacked training. He was a doctor, not a xenobiologist. Research training had been taboo in school, except for a favored few. The reports continued to come in, confirming the danger. They seemed to have the worst plague on their hands in all human history, and nobody who could do anything about it even knew of it. "'Molly reports that your letter got some results,' Jake reported. "'Chris Ryan brought home one of the electron microscopes and a bunch of equipment from the hospital pathology room. Think she'll get anywhere?' Doc doubted it. Damn it, he hadn't meant for her to try it, though she might have authority for routine experiments, but it was like her to refuse to pass on the word without trying to prove her own suspicion of him first. He tried to comfort himself with the fact that some men were immune, or seemed so. About three out of a hundred showed no signs. If that immunity was hereditary, it might save the race, if not— Jake came in at twilight with a grim face. More news from Molly. The lobby is starting out to comb every village with a fault finder, starting here, and this hole will show up like a sore thumb. Better start packing. We gotta be out of here in less than an hour. End of chapter 7 Recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 8 of Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Fool. Three days later, Doc saw his first runner. The tractor was churning through the sand just before sundown, heading toward another one night stand at a new village. Lou was driving while Doc and Jake brooded silently in the back, paying no attention to the colors that were blazoned over the dunes. The cat-and-mouse game was getting to Doc. There was no real assurance that the village they were approaching might not be the target the lobby had chosen for the next investigation. Lou braked the tractor to a sudden halt and pointed. A figure was running frantically over one of the low dunes with the little red sun behind him. He seemed headed toward them, but as he drew nearer, they could see that he had no definite direction. He simply ran, pumping his legs frantically, as if all the devils of hell were after him. His body swayed from side to side in exhaustion, but his arms and legs pumped on. "'Stop him!' Jake ordered, and Lou swung the tractor. It halted squarely in the runner's path, and the figure struck against it and toppled. The legs went on pumping, digging into the dirt and gravel, but the man was too far gone to rise. Jake and Lou shoved him through the doors into the tractor, and Doc yanked off his aspirator. The man was giving vent to a kind of ululating cry, weakened now almost to a whine that rose and fell with the motion of his legs. Sweat had once streaked his haggard face, but it was dry and blanched to a pasty gray. Doc injected enough narcotic to quiet a maddened bull. It had no effect except to upset the rhythm of the arms and legs. It took five more minutes for the man to die. The specks were larger this time, the size of periods in twelve-point type. The lump at the base of the skull was as big as a small hen's egg. "'From Edison like the others so far, Jack Cooley,' Jake answered Doc's question. Durwood spent a lot of time here on his first expedition, so it's getting the worst of it. Doc pulled the aspirator mask back over the man's face, and they carried him out and laid him on a low dune. They couldn't risk returning the corpse to its people. This was only the primary circle of infection, direct from Durwood. The second circle could be ten times as large as the infection spread from one to a few to many. So far, it was localized, but it wouldn't stay that way. Doc climbed slowly out of the tractor, lugging his small supplies of equipment while Jake made arrangements for them to spend the night in a deserted house. 
but the figure of the runner and his own failures to find more about the disease kept haunting doc he began setting up his equipment grimly better get some sleep jake suggested you're a mite more tired than you think anyhow i thought you told me you couldn't do any more with what you've got feldman looked at the supplies he had spread out and shook his head wearily He'd been over every chemical and combination a dozen times without results that showed in the limited magnification of the optical mic. He snapped the case shut and hit the rude table with the heel of his hand. There are other supplies. Jake, do you have any signal to get in touch with Molly at the Ryan house? Three wraps on the rear left window. I'll get Lou. No! Doc came to his feet, reaching for his jacket. They're looking for three men now. It's safer if I go alone, and I'm the only one who knows what supplies are needed. With luck, I may even get the electron mic. Got a gun I can borrow? Jake found one somewhere, an old revolver with a few loads. He began protesting, but Doc overruled him sharply. Three men could no more fight off the police than one, if they were spotted. He swung toward the tractor. You'd better start spreading the word on everything we know. If people realize they're already safe or doomed, it'll be better than having them going crazy to avoid contagion. Most of the villages know already, Jake told him. And damn it, get back here, Doc. If you can't make it, turn tail quick and we'll think of something else. Southport seemed normal enough as Doc drove through its streets. The stereo house was open, and the little shops were brightly lighted. He stopped once to pull a copy of Southport's little newspaper from a dispenser. All was quiet on its front page, too. As usual, though, the facts were buried inside. The editorial was pouring too much oil on the waters in its lauding of the role of medical lobby on Mars for no apparent reason. The death notices no longer listed the cause of death. Medical knew something was up, at least, and was worried. He parked the tractor behind Chris's house and slipped to the proper window. Everything was seemingly quiet there. At his knock the shade was drawn back, and he caught a brief glimpse of Molly looking out. A moment later she opened the rear lock to let him into the kitchen. Shh! She's still up, I think. What can I do, Doc? He tried to smile at her. Hide me until it's safe to get into her laboratory. I've got to— The inner kitchen door was kicked open, and Chris stood beyond it, holding a cocked gun in her hand. It took longer than I expected, Dan, she said quietly. But after your letter, I knew you'd swallow the bait. You bloody fool! Did you really believe I'd start doing research here just because of your imaginings? He slumped slowly back against the sink. So this is a fool's errand, then? There never was any equipment here? Oh, the equipment's here, in my office. I guessed your spies would report it, so it had to be here. But it won't help you now, pariah Feldman. He came from his braced position against the sink like a spring uncoiling. He expected her to shoot, but hoped the surprise would ruin her aim. Then it was too late, and his boot hit the gun savagely, knocking it from her hand. Life in the villages had hardened him surprisingly. She was comparatively helpless in his hands. A few minutes later, he had her bound securely with surgical tape Molly brought him. She raged furiously in the chair where he dumped her, then gave up. They'll get you, Daniel Feldman. Surprisingly, there was no rage in her voice now. You won't get away from us. The planet isn't big enough. I got away from your trial, he reminded her. And I got away and lived when you left me without a chance on the ground of the spaceport. She laughed harshly. You got away, then? You fool! Who do you think gave you the extra battery so you could live long enough to be helped at the spaceport? Who hired a fool like Matthew so you wouldn't get the death sentence you deserved? Who let you get away as an herb doctor for months before you set yourself up as God and a traitor to mankind again? It shook him, as it was probably intended to do. How had she known about the extra battery? He'd always assumed that Ben had returned to give it to him. But in that case, Chris couldn't know of it. Then he hardened himself again, 
In the old days she'd always had one trump card he couldn't beat and hadn't expected. But too much was involved for games now. "'Any police around, Molly?' he asked. Molly came back a minute later to report that everything looked clear, and to show him where the equipment had been set up in Chris's office. It was all there, including the Electron Mike, a beautiful little portable model. There was even a small incubator with its own heat source, into which he immediately transferred the little bottles he'd been keeping warm against his skin. Most of the equipment had never been unpacked, which made loading it onto his tractor ridiculously easy. "'Better come with me now, Molly,' he suggested at last. Then he turned to Chris, who was watching him with almost no expression. "'You can wriggle your chair to the phone in half an hour, I guess. Knock the phone off and yell for help. It's better than you deserve, unless you really did leave me that battery.' "'You won't get away with it,' she told him again, calmly this time. "'No,' he admitted. "'Probably not.' But maybe the human race will, if I have time to find an answer to the plague you won't see under your nose. But you won't get away with it either. In the long run, your kind never do. Molly was sniffling as they drove away. It had probably been the best life she'd known, Doc supposed. Chris could be kind to menials. But now Molly's work was done and she'd have to disappear into the villages. He let her off at the first village and drove on alone. He was itching to get to the microscope now, hardly able to wait through the long journey back to Jake. His impatience grew with each mile. Finally he gave up. He swung the tractor into a small gully between sand dunes, left the motor idling, and pulled down the shades the villagers used for blackout traveling. There was power enough for the mic here, and the cab was big enough for what he had to do. He mounted the mic on the tractor seat and began laying out the collection of smears and cultures he had brought. It had been years since he'd made a film for the electron mic, but he found it all came back to him as he worked. His hands were sweating with tension as he inserted the first film into the chamber. He had the magnetic lenses set for 20,000 power, but a quick glance showed it was too weak. He raised the power to 50,000. The filaments were there clear and distinct. He turned on the little tape recorder that had been part of Chris's equipment and set the microphone where he could dictate into it without stopping to make clumsy notes. He readjusted the focus carefully, carrying on a running commentary. Then he gasped. Each of the little filaments carried three tiny darker sections. Each was a cell complete in itself with the typical Martian triple nucleus. He put a film with a tiny section of the nerve tissue from a corpse into the chamber next, and again a quick glance at the screen was enough. The filaments were there, thickly crowded among nerve cells. They did travel along the nerves to reach the base of the brain before the larger lump could form. A specimen from one of the black specks was even more interesting. The filaments were there but some were changed or changing into tiny round cells also with the triple dark spots of nuclei. Those must be the final form that was released to infect others. Probably at first these multiplied directly in epithelial tissue so that there was a rapid contagion of infection. Eventually they must form the filaments that invaded the nerves and caused the brief bodily reaction that was Selznick's migraine. Then the body adapted to them, and they began to incubate slowly, developing into the large cells he had first seen. When ripe, the big cells broke apart into millions of the tiny round ones that went back to the nerve endings, causing the black spots and killing the host. He knew his enemy now, at least. He reached for the controls, increasing the magnification. He would lose resolution, but he might find something more at the extreme limits of the mic. Something wet and cold gushed into his face. He jerked back, trying to wipe it off, but it was already evaporating, and there was a thick, acrid odor in the cab. He grabbed for his aspirator, then tried to reach the airlock, but paralysis was already spreading through him, and he toppled to the floor before he could escape. When he came to, it was morning outside. 
and Chris was waiting inside the cab with two big lobby policemen. A hypo in her hand must have been what revived him. She touched the electron microscope with something like affection. The lobby technicians did a good job on this, don't you think, Dan? I warned you, but you wouldn't listen. And now we've even got your own taped words to prove you were doing forbidden research. Fool! She shook her head pityingly as the tractor began moving, with two others, towards Southport. You and your phony diseases, a little skin disorder, Selznick's migraine, and a few cases of psychosis to make a new disease. Do you think medical lobby can't check on such simple things? Or didn't you expect us to hear of your open talk of revolt and realize you were planning to create some new germ to wipe out Earth forces? Maybe those runners of yours were real, mass murderer. She drew out another hypo and shoved the needle into his arm. Necrosynth. Enough to keep him unconscious for twenty-four hours. He started to curse her, but the drug acted before he could complete the thought. End of chapter 8 Recording by Thomas Rose